Hey everyone, I hope you are well and welcome to the first ever We Are Listening online event. In fact, this is the biggest one we've ever done, so thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Victoria and I'm the founder of We Are Listening and Creative Marketing Manager of Tool and Records. Um, for you that might not know already, so We Are Listening is our female platform and event series to help grow, nurture and find more female talent in the industry. Today we have some amazing panels planned and I hope everyone watching this comes away feeling inspired and comes away feeling that they've, you know, they found the day genuinely useful and helpful. This panel is called Behind the Artist, Alternative Careers in the Music Industry and today we are going to be joined by Becky Rascal. Hi. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. How are you, love? Yeah, good. It's been absolute years since I've I seen know. you. I know. I think last time I seen you was like I beat the rocks about ten years ago. <laughs> oh, so good! I'm so excited that you're joining us on the panel today. Oh, um, I'd also like to invite Rachel Divine into the conversation from the Kiss Network. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Really good, thank you. Really good. Wicked. We've got Roberta Hickey from uh, Little Pink Book joining us. Hi, Carly. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, yeah, really good, thank you. Um, we've got Julia from Our Kid Brother. Hey Carly, how are you doing? You alright? Yeah, really good. Thank you so much for all joining us. And lastly, we've got Amy McKnight as well. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good, Carly, how are you? Yeah, really good. So I just wanted to start by explaining a bit about what this panel is about. So when you're starting out in the music industry, there can be so many different routes that you can end up taking, especially if you're the type of person that wants to help support, nurture and develop new artists. So on today's panel, we've brought together all of you who work in very, very different roles behind the scenes in the music industry um, and to have a conversation about how working behind the scenes and working to help support the artists that we love can be not only massively exciting but have real longevity as well so what I'd love to do is start by finding out a little bit about who you are what you do and your current job title um should we start with you Becky yeah sure so uh oh god I don't even know where to start I'm a bit of a music industry jack of all trades I've done event management artist management agents but now I am running Camel Fat Club in Liverpool as GM. So that's one role that I'm doing. And alongside that, I'm on the board for Liverpool Audio Network. Um, we have a music summit, which is like a two-day Liverpool's answer to the, a mini ADE. But the aim of that is totally aimed at like grassroots artists and minority groups within the music industry and providing a platform education and support for those groups with the view to kind of i don't know um take liverpool's like existing heritage of music and like bring it into the future and support an artist along the way while we're doing that so i'm keeping busy <laughs> basically yeah, it sounds brilliant i bet you can't wait for clubs to open again so that club can reopen yeah, well luckily um liverpool has thankfully been recognized as important on the event scene so we've got thanks to the circus crew we've got uh the 30th of april liverpool are having at the six thousand capacity um club night on in Bramley Mordoch so yeah that that could go either way but I'm definitely going either way <laughs> how does that work is that are they going to be testing people We're or a like... pilot scheme yeah so I think like Yousef's obviously been heavily involved in it and uh, yeah so we get to go out before everyone else so let's see if we all survive hopefully <laughs> <laughs> okay Rachel I'd love to come on to you tell us a bit about what, what you do um, yeah, so I um, work at KISS, uh, across the KISS network, so I work in the sort of radio side of things. Um, I uh, work in the music team, so my job title is music and content producer. So I work with our amazing head of music, Nathan, and um, basically just anything music related at KISS is, is what we do. So, you know, programming music, doing the playlist um content with artists everything that is is music is kind of comes under our jobs fantastic stuff roberta tell us a bit about what you do so i'm a little bit like becky actually kind of a few different um fingers in different pies so i um i'm founder of music consultancy little pink book and with that i kind of do a number of things i guess it kind of all falls under partnerships so whether that's brand partnerships so connecting artists to brands 
or whether it's connecting like music platforms to artists. So kind of both sides of it there. Um, one of my biggest clients is Beatport. So I consult them on their creative services, which is really exciting because their platform is huge. So it's kind of taking that to brands and thinking of really creative ways that we can use um, Beatport for them to reach their audience. Um, and then I also manage Sarah Story, who you'd have heard on the radio panel earlier. Um, and then there's Little Pink Book as well is also the kind of flip side of it is that it's a women in music uh, platform. So with that, do events and obviously more recently virtual events uh, and just kind of the ethos of that is really championing women in the industry and uh, to really help like push towards equalizing the industry by shining a light on women who are really excelling and kind of setting them up as role models for younger women to encourage them to get more involved. Well done, because I remember when you just left MTV and you were going out freelance on your own, you didn't know how it was yeah. going to work out, and now you're absolutely flying. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Julia, on to you. Um, I'm a bit similar to Becky and Roberta as well, a um, bit of a jack of all trades. I mean, I, I started in the music industry more than 20 years ago, um, and I've done everything from brand partnerships to artist liaison. Um, but I've kind of landed in the world of production, so most of my days now are spent either repping, doing promoter repping for AG, which is quite production heavy. I don't know what other um, promoters are like. Sorry if my dog's barking in the background, by the way. <laughs> um, and uh, I also do a lot of festival stage production, a couple of festivals around London, a bit of festival programming, um, and then I do a lot of tour management as well. Fantastic. And on to you, Amy, tell us a bit about what you do. So um, also do a bit of everything. Started out <laughs> as a DJ um, 20 years ago and then um, also took on production, top lining like that. So the creative side. But over the last few years, I've been working a lot in sync um, and behind the scenes and doing lots of bespoke compositions whilst kind of still incorporating my kind of commercial production uh, background and um, making kind of modern scores for different um, brands fascinating stuff well done um and all of you have completely different backgrounds which is just so great for this panel so what i'd love to start off by finding out is a bit about how you got into your role did you study a music degree was it just because you wanted to work in the music industry becky i'd love to start that with you if that's okay yeah again not conventional um my degree was in journalism um my brother says it's the longest anyone ever took to complete a three-year degree <laughs> <laughs> it took me about five years of deferring. Um, and then I graduated and ended up as head of PR for Pioneer, as in Pioneer DJ. So I started there and literally just started working alongside loads of DJs, obviously like Pioneer Pro DJs, and then started getting asked to do a bit of management work and a bit of PR work for people. And then from there, I went into management, then started doing some agent stuff as well. And then eventually ended up in um event management and now clubs so it wasn't like a conventional route at all for me it just kind of ended up that way um but mostly i'd say it was through networking and probably chatting a lot backstage and in smoking areas and just getting people's phone numbers <laughs> it's amazing how you can actually do so much of your work in those areas Honest to God, I think I've got most of my jobs in, in a smoking area before. <laughs> but I, that's, I, that's my advice I always give to people as well, is just networking all the time, get too much in music. And as well, it's nice to call on people and get other people jobs that way as well, like recommending people that way. It's definitely about helping one another completely yeah. that. Um, Rachel, how did you get into what you do? Um, yeah, kind of it was never really planned I was initially going to go to uni and do like a science degree or something because I think I just thought that like I always loved music but I was like you can't do that as a job though right like I think I just wasn't quite sure and then went to uni and did a radio degree and um and sort of fell in love with radio but music was always like my first passion and I always wanted it wanted what I did to incorporate music in some way and then learning that there was a way you could do that with working in radio and actually you can you know program music you can champion artists you can do all these different things suddenly this light kind of went on and I was like this is what I need to do like this is like what I have to do um 
so I then did student radio, did loads of work experience, just did like random things when I was at uni, like putting gigs on and things like that. Just tried to do anything I could to be around music and events and radio. And then, yeah, um, started working in the industry, worked at a radio station called Amazing Radio, where it's all about like scouting new music. And then um, joined Bauer like seven years ago. And then ever since just kind of worked at different places there. So yeah it was a it was a university thing but i think actually what i did in my degree has it hasn't helped me get a job in any way it's the work experience that i did was what actually got me the job but also the kind of passion and love to go this is what i need to do awesome stuff roberta what about you yeah mine was kind of a bit different and almost accidental because my school was so traditional and at the time I thought like at uni all you could do really was like English history or like politics was probably the most like left field and um and then when it came to it and I got my results I was like I'm really and we had to go to school on Saturday so I was like I've done so much of these things I can't do a subject that I did at school so kind of just decided to go through clearing it was literally just looking through the newspaper with my dad and then saw and I knew what to go to Leeds and I saw they had this course called communications and I was like okay that sounds really interesting and I was a bit like cool yeah I'll just do that um and then when I got there it was so interesting and it was very much kind of like media and brands and then music as well but kind of same with Rachel I didn't know like I always loved music but I had no idea like how you would even get a job in it or what the jobs would be um and then I did the radio and like least student radio and kind of same as Becky like the nightlife in Leeds was amazing so I was out a lot I'm meeting people um I love that and then when I finished uni I did a season in Ibiza which has actually helped me so much in my career with like I still speak to people that I met now and obviously just kind of learning about I was just I was like flying for cream and uh Tiesto at Privilege but it was two huge nights and you do get to learn about it and then we do this like dinner once a week um with the DJs and it was just that was really good but at the time my dad was like get home you need to get a job what are you doing um and then I got back and I was literally I'm from Doncaster and there's really like nothing the two companies there are Tarmac and Polypipe which I was just like <laughs> not for me um so I was just applying for anything I could in London just like setting my CV going just to like all the record labels and all the advertising agencies and then ended up getting a job as like a digital planner buyer which I didn't know what it was um but it ended up that it's when you kind of um you plan where like the advertising goes online so it was really good like learning all about was this was like 10 years ago so learning all about how digital worked and all digital formats was actually amazing and then i realized that i only cared if it was something to do with music and then i kind of moved from there from just doing the kind of ad buying side to doing a social media strategy course and then moved out of media and then got a job doing social media, like content creation and management for Carl Cox. So that's the kind of Ibiza thing just really helped with that. Um, so it was just kind of, I, I was just kind of knew kind of where I wanted to be and just needed to get through a door really, and then kind of adapted what skills I had and what experience I had to then channel that into to getting into music. And it just goes back to the networking thing, doesn't it? The music industry yeah. is built on relationships and the people that you meet along the way and helping mm. one another out. And it's not always about taking from people, it's about giving as well. And I think that's something that's just so important for new people to understand is that sometimes you can find people who, who want loads of help, but they're not willing to, to do the teamwork aspect. And I think that's when networking really does come into its own. Um, mm -hmm. Julia, what was your route in? Um, I kind of fell into it by chance as well because I was at uni doing film and TV production in Liverpool but I was obviously a 90s raver um, and I managed to blag some work experience at Cream so I did Cream Ibiza probably about 10 years before you Roberta made it <laughs> um, when it was you know there was no internet in them days no social media we were literally flying by the seat of our pants how and, great and I think <laughs> what you were saying Carly about the team you know the, the, the team of Cream Scott and Jill who probably all of you know are still you know lifelong friends of mine now and we all still work in the industry and we all still talk to each other and support each other and and you know we were a bunch of young kids then and in a way we kind of made it up as we went along and you know here, here, we, here we are 20 years later sitting around talking to you guys who most of you are probably sort of 10 years younger than me and then that ethos is still the same because you know I think it was you Roberta said the advice you give to people getting in the industry now mine is always 
just be sound, be be available, be reliable. You know, have the right attitude and, and a sense of humour and stamina. You know, if you're someone that needs 12 hours sleep every night, it's probably not for you. But, you know, there's a lot of young people that come in because weirdly there wasn't such thing as a degree in event management or whatever then. And a lot of people that are coming out of uni now, you know, they, they won't brush the floor. It's like, well, that's what stage managers do. We brush the floor and we put some tapes down. That, that's how it is. Uh, and... I think you see those people once, but then, I mean, there's a couple of people, like, I've never met you, Becky, but I've heard your name around for probably, you know, the last 10 years or so, because you're the scouser as well. <laughs> yeah. we just all bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think we know a lot of the same people, Liverpool this morning. Yeah, I'm very likely. Yeah, I've been in London 15 years though now, but Carly, I probably met you 10 years ago, and you do, you yeah. see the same, like, we're all sat here because we know Laura, who's give us a call, will you do mm -hmm. this, can you give your time? And if that's what it's about, supporting each other, and especially the women in the industry, you know, it's, there's a lot more of us now, and it's 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 a great thing to see. But you know, the wrong ones, you see them once, and you never see them again. It's just you've got to have the right attitude. Just be silent. It's fine. We can teach you everything. Else. Well said. So Brilliant, Amy. What about you? Well, um, I did the traditional kind of education thing, but like Rachel said, it, I don't think I've ever used my degree once in my life. No one's ever asked to see it. Um, <laughs> still paying it off, but no one's ever asked to see it. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I learned from DJing, from staying after gigs, from um, hanging around the technicians. And that's how I got into the production side of things as well. And that's how it developed into producing um and i've always been songwriting but i never wanted to be an artist oh look at it i never <laughs> wanted to be like you know on the stage singing look at me that just wasn't me and um i figured out um that production was really what i wanted to do but more like an old school producer so produce projects for people not necessarily put my name to it or have to tour it um so i started doing a lot more of that and then naturally that kind of developed into networking like everyone's talking about and just suddenly realizing there's so many other things that I can do as a producer so that's why I fell into sync and bespoke um, and now composing for tv and film so it was like an organic journey but yeah definitely I wouldn't say traditional and um, yeah I think I've learned more from YouTube than I did from my degree 15 <laughs> years ago. And um, what it goes to show with what all of you do is that the music industry has so many different aspects so you could start and you decide that you want to work in one area and then actually you find yourself getting interested in another area and actually you wow. can bend and flex and you end up being involved in all different areas and and actually that's why it makes it so interesting and you never get bored so what i'd love to know from all of you and starting with you becky first is what does a typical day at work look like for you um well at the moment it's all just planning like during the during lockdown um it was planning with like having no idea what we were planning for whether we'd have to plan for socially distance events whether we could be planning a big big scale event we didn't know what we were planning for we were just kind of putting ideas on the table but now that we've got like all being well um the roadmap um with the club you know it's just kind of like coming up with ideas for um curating the nights um taking bookings for the nights that we have got in everything's quite admin at the moment um in terms of liverpool audio network and electronic sound summit since the roadmap got announced we've just been like all guns blazing with that we've been like our aim is we're doing our event in the baltic triangle in liverpool so we really want to kind of focus on um like cultural cultural recovery in liverpool so we're right really working with all the independent venues independent artists and everything so we're just trying to like box all that in at the moment like now that we've got dates and everything locked in it's just been sorting all of that out um but then as soon as the club opens i guess things will be a lot different i'll be working until six o'clock in the morning at the club um probably just demented all day with the phone ringing and uh yeah, everything really in the club, like ordering stock and just kind of like all the boring behind the scenes stuff, along with all of like the fun stuff as well, like, you know, all the production and artists and everything. So, yeah, just keeping on your toes, basically. Generally a busy day now. And Rachel, I can imagine your day is a little bit different to Becky's. What do you do day to day? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a bit different, but... Um... 
I mean, at the moment, we're all still working remotely. So everything we're doing is is like this, is on Zoom. So there's a lot of Zoom calls um, with uh, our head of music, Nath, and we chat about music all day, every day, basically. Um, so, you know, my day's kind of split up into three sort of main things, which is programming music. So we're looking at the station, any sort of station in the KISS network and kind of going, what music are we going to play when? and actually programming that and then delivering that to the shows so that they've got the best mix of music that they can have. Um, and then a big portion of, of my day is taken up with just listening to stuff. You know, we get sent so much music. It's, you know, it's hard to keep on top of. So you have to constantly, constantly be listening, um, especially at the moment. It feels like this week alone is like everybody's releasing music. So it's like our inboxes is just music after music after music. So it's like, that is a big part of our day is just listening to stuff. And then, you know, you want to give everything you listen to um, the time that it deserves. So sometimes you're listening to it and then you'll come back to it a little bit later with a sort of different ear and and listen to it a little bit differently. And then the sort of third thing that I'm doing at the moment is just organising content with artists, especially now as things are starting to ease a little bit, more artists are uh, back in doing like, face-to-face -face promo so you start to think about okay well what does that look like what are we going to start doing um so yeah that's kind of like how my days are working at the moment is those are the the three big points but just lots of listening to music what a great way to spend a day i mean I, I can't complain <laughs> i get to say that i do that as a job like my family don't think it's real so um, <laughs> it is oh i love it okay roberta what about you um mine's so varied day to day which is one thing that i i love actually but kind of one thing that I've started doing with regards to kind of things that are a bit more creative. So say if we had a brief in from a brand that we needed to respond to for Beatport, I actually started kind of getting, doing that as soon as I wake up. So at like half seven, and I've got this like little, that I bought over lockdown, like a little table, like a little desk that you can use on the sofa and your bed that my boyfriend says it's like a grandma table from an old people's <laughs> home, but I actually love it. And I literally will get that out and, and just get it, get the kind of brief done. I feel like I'm more creative in the mornings and then it's before emails have started to happen and distractions. So I don't do that every morning, but kind of if I have something, then I will kind of do that and get that out and then have a bit of a break and maybe do a workout and then kind of go back in. And then it's just a mixture of kind of with Sarah, there's kind of loads of different aspects that Sarah covers. So it will be kind of um, speaking to the managers to get kind of studio time in with her for like top line or producing. And um, she has a podcast, so I kind of like book the talent for that. So if you're doing that, um, also sending invoices, chasing invoices, that stuff. And then kind of balancing the projects that I've got on with also reaching out to people. So letting them know um, about Little Pink Book and probably having kind of what Rachel said, Zoom calls, obviously. Um, and just kind of connecting with people. I have actually found over lockdown, I've made kind of, I say like friends, but like actually connected with so many new people. Um, I think obviously people have had more time on their hands and people have been really um, reciprocative, is that the right word? But up for like collaborating and speaking. So actually kind of a lot of time just being on Zoom, just chatting to people about how we can work together and things that we can make happen, which has been amazing. Um, so yeah, but super varied and then a mixture of kind of focusing on what I'm doing and then and then also kind of pitching for new business, I guess. And then if I'm working on any events with Little Pink Book, um, yeah, making them happen. So lots of self-starting stuff, coming up with loads of ideas. Yes. Yeah, yeah, just easier some days than other. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. Julia, what about you? Um, depends where I am, really. I mean, if, if I'm sort of advancing a festival or a tour, I'm generally sat in this chair for 12 hours a day locked into email um but if you know summertime I, I, most of my work is live so obviously this last year has been a write-off but in normal year it's summertime i'm generally on site so you know from sort of eight in the morning until in an ideal world sort of midnight getting old now um but yeah i mean you know loading in drum anything drum kits battling with weather chasing after crew you know uh, or looking after artists, chasing after artists, strands, whatever, airport, duty-free, that they've managed to get themselves lost <laughs> in. Um, so it, it depends, really, but that, that's one of my favourite things about it. Every day is different, you know. I don't mind putting in the sort of 12-hour office days because I, I generally work from home and freelance um, because I do spend a lot of time away from home as well, so it's a nice balance for me. 
Yeah, yeah, every day is different. So lots of organisation, lots of patience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, what about you? Um, kind of the same. Like every day is a bit varied. I'm super lucky to have um, my studio set up here now. I used to run my own studio in London and um, managed to get everything out just before lockdown 1.0. Um, and set up shop here and um, I've been able to carry on work and it's been really busy um, as soon as production started again so it's like when shows is getting made and stuff um, lots of work started coming in again um, so it will be probably two to three zooms a day at the moment I would say I'm averaging on um, just like talking to people figuring out what we can do together collaborations which is something I'm really big on um, I guess part of what I do also is a bit like A&R, so I'm always trying to put different people together. Um, even though I also am a creative, I feel like that's kind of part of the producer's job behind the scenes as well, making sure you can um, uh, get kind of the right people on the right projects and make it work. So I spend some of my time doing that. And then, yeah, I sound design, working with audio. I sit there on my synthesizers being a geek. Um, yeah, that's about it. Also, a wicked way to spend a day. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'd love to throw out there, actually, because it's something that Julia touched on, and I want to throw this out to all of you. So whoever wants to take this question, then um, you're more than welcome to go with it. But how's your job been impacted in the last year? Obviously, Julia, you said that, you know, touring and stuff just probably hasn't really happened. But, yeah, how has it affected what you do? Um, everything stopped. I would say 95% of what I do is live. The last show I did was uh, for AG Rep and Brit Week with War Child. So they do a series of two weeks of shows around the Brit Awards. That was February 2019. I think we did about 16 shows. Um, so I was looking forward to a nice week off after that, but I wasn't expecting a year <laughs> off. Um, but weirdly, a lot of the events, sort of live events industry people, um, we ended up working for the NHS, doing a lot of the COVID response stuff in London. So I'm actually still working. I'm, I'm currently a COVID test centre manager by day. Um, but I also, it is just starting to filter back in. Like I've got a couple of festival confirmations, but, you know, promoters, everyone's, we've all just been pushing paper around our desks for 12 months because a lot of the promoters are sort of sitting there going, well, we've had to sort of force the government's hands, put shows on sale. Most of them are sold out still no guarantee they're going to go ahead and a lot of a lot of them are sort of going well you know there's this whole question mark around insurance for live events which isn't it's not looking like the government are going to underwrite it so no one really wants to sort of spend money until the 21st of june when at least we might have a better indication because i think everyone's sort of rushing into it as well a little bit it's only march you know september is still what five six months away so it's like looking at shows in may in october the previous year like right, in terms of the time scales and this would we would just be about starting depends on what role you do um but yeah it's been it's been a weird year but I, do you know what the, the, the positive thing that's come out of it for me is i've sort of seen true colors of a lot a lot of people and i don't mean bad true colors i mean good true colors a lot of people have really stepped up and gone do you need help you guys in the lab industry you know what can we do just good clients as well saying you know do you want to do you need any money for example just on a really sort of basic level because a lot of us are freelance a lot of us are excluded i know you know it's great seeing companies getting the arts council grants and stuff but for me the actual lifters and shifters on the ground have, have sort of been abandoned a lot and it's good to a lot of the companies that did get the grants have gone that next level down to grassroots and gone are you guys okay and and that for me the loyalty there is is you know solid but when we do reopen that really is so good to hear that that's happened and fair play to you for getting yourself involved with the covid test centers as well because <laughs> i suppose you get to the stage don't you your work stops what do you do you have to make it work it's called survival and i think that's what a lot of people have had to do this year has it impacted any of you yeah, I also ended up on the NHS test and trace calls. So I was on the, I was on one phone like "Hello NHS," and then the other phone was like "Hello Mansion." So I didn't know what <laughs> I was going to do, whether I was going to be taking like COVID tests for someone. Then I was doing vaccination um, bookings as well. So that was a bit alternative from going to like before that. Obviously, my summer would usually have been running like between two and five thousand capacity nightclub events like as event manager or logistics or whatever in Ibiza in a club full of people from all over the world which is a concept that now is so alien like 
like even being able to go out with your mates now is just like oh my god I can't believe we can go to a beer garden so that has been massive but the good thing with Liverpool was because we were in tier two at Christmas time we got to open up venues and hospitality again um with social distancing and government restrictions so I was absolutely made up because I was on the phones and then I got a message from the mansion team to ask me did I want to come and be GM at the club because during lockdown when you're so used to running these massive events and just being surrounded by people all the time and being such a social person like I kind of it got to like December and January and I was like about no, October November and I was like, I can't remember what I do. Like, what, what is my purpose? <laughs> I'm not giving somebody guest list. I don't really know what I do with my time. <laughs> so, like, being able to open everything up again, like, for that period, has, like, made me more driven now for this second wave of reopening, hopefully, all being well. Yeah, impacted. I it. definitely, we all have to, like, adapt and kind of... I didn't really like the... Obviously, like advice to reskill and retrain but i mean sometimes mm. it's something just to be able to carry on doing what you love alongside it i think it's that's that, that that skill though comes from you know we, we run live events a, a lot of us and that that's what running live events as well is making stuff happen so yeah. it, it's the same same approach isn't it? it's like, you've got to pay your mortgage you've got to pay your rent then you just got to make something happen yeah. and everyone did and and you know fair play mm. Has the last year impacted any of the rest of you? Um, yeah, it's been a bit kind of a, a little bit all over the place, really, for me. But now I feel it's kind of gone full circle. So at the start, it was just, I think, kind of how it would have been for everyone, just so mental. Just everything within a few days just literally fell out of my diary. Kind of stuff that I was working on, like meetings that I had in with people to chat about projects. And it was just kind of such a bizarre feeling. And then because kind of what you were saying with freelancers, um, I was like in that loophole, so I was the sole director of a limited company. So you kind of fell down the cracks of kind of getting no support. So it was kind of, it was scary. And then I kind of did um, some volunteering at a food bank up the road, which was it, which was actually so good because it was out the house every day. And two of my friends did it who were furloughed. And it was in like the depth of lockdown where we wouldn't have been able to see each other. So I actually got to see them and leave the house. I think if I would have just been sat at home, like stressing about it, it would have been so much worse. So I think that saved me a bit, to be honest, just being able to leave the house and, and see people. Um, and then I got approached to go full time for a company. So I was like, oh my gosh, I really need to do to do this. So I did it, but I do feel a little bit like I kind of undersold myself a bit. I kind of, I don't know, I was definitely just kind of thought I really need to get something. And I think kind of the, the fear of the situation um, kind of drove me to that. So worked for them for like nine months and then they actually tried to change strategy and made a lot of the content team redundant at the start of this year. So then I went back into freelancing. But after the while, like what Becky said, I was a bit like, what do I do? And I was like, started to put my deck together. And I was like, yeah, but that's not happening. And I haven't actually done that for like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So it was really kind of taking a bit of time to have a think and be like, okay, you know, you, I don't know, kind of have a bit of confidence back a bit, I guess, and to kind of have a real think and, and kind of, yeah, get it and it was good actually doing the deck so I was like okay I do do stuff I do know things um and then when you start having conversations again I felt like I felt like my excitement for, for the kind of the industry return and my confidence and and it's all kind of worked out now because I feel things are kind of seeming a lot more positive um, and it's great to be back freelance so bit of a weird one but it's all it's all worked out because <laughs> those skills don't go away and and that's the thing yeah. in all the jobs that you're learning there's always things that you're learning along the way that can cross over into completely different areas of the yeah. music industry and beyond you know and I think that's why when you're freelance you kind of pick up stuff along the way but you don't yeah. always realize that's what you're doing and yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Okay, so one thing I'd like to know, so we've got five minutes left of this panel. For anybody watching, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments section and I can put them forward to the panel for you. But one thing I'd love to know from all of you, and I think starting with Amy, um, mm -hmm. is what's the best thing about working in the music industry for you? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> the music? <laughs> uh, <laughs> fun. Yeah, I, but the fact that I get to do what I love. Like it's it's amazing. Like Rachel said earlier, like it, it was almost like um, 
I, when when you're younger, you think it's like not possible. You're like, what? I can make money from playing on a synthesizer or working in a club. And um, yeah, so for me, it's the music. That's the best thing about it. Awesome, Rachel. What about you? Yeah, I feel like I'm going to sort of echo it a little bit, but it but it is the music. I mean, it's a mix of music and radio for me. I think it is the music, but also what I would say is it's being able to do something you love and being able to like, you know, finish the day and think I got to do something today that just fulfilled me with such passion or whatever that I think I know that not everybody gets to feel that way. And so I know that I'm lucky to feel that way because I know that it's not that case for everybody. I think the other thing as well for me, and I think, you know, Julia maybe touched on it a little bit talking about networking is, is the people like the people that I work with are amazing like from our presenters to the rest of the production team programming team whatever everybody that I work with is amazing the pluggers and the labels that we work with at KISS are incredible to us and you know everybody that you get to work with from managers to artists to labels to people in the radio industry are just passionate people who love what they do and so there's something really special about being around people who do what they love because I think it makes me feel like, oh my God, I just want to do more and I want to do better or I want to do this. And so, yeah, and I think sometimes I'll probably take that for granted, but yeah, I feel pretty lucky. And I think after this last year, none of us are ever going to take any of this industry for granted when something's been taken away and, you know, no. you suddenly appreciate that and what we had. And it is about that being surrounded by a load of people who just absolutely love what they do. Uh, Becky, what about you? Yeah, the, definitely the people, but I'm going to say, like, the end product for me. So, like, if I'm doing it with an event or a club or, you know, if we've put on something, for me, it's, like, the buzz. Like, everyone in the crowd just having a ball and, like, getting text messages the next day and saying, thanks so much for last night. We had the best time ever. Like, I get a proper buzz from that. I love that. And also, like, in lockdown, um, just the whole sense of community, really. Like, in lockdown, I ended up becoming mates of people like so many people and I only moved back to Liverpool um at the end of the Ibiza season in 2020 2019 I forgot what year it was um and I ended up just like because everyone was talking online and on like zoom chat and everything I ended up becoming so many like meeting so many boss people in Liverpool who now we're all like working together and doing little projects together so I just love that you don't know each other but you've just got this like common interest in music you might know a few people the same and then all of a sudden you're all best mates and working together I just love that like that's my absolute best thing about it all and obviously the tunes <laughs> <laughs> um, Julia what about you um, I think for me, I, I've, I've sort of been around long enough now to, to be look. I'm, I'm obviously blessed, but for me, it's the freedom. Like the people, okay. obviously, what Rachel was saying, you know, my friends that I worked with 20 years ago at Cream are still my mates now, you know, and I mean, like proper mates, solid mates. Um, and I've met so many new younger people as well. And, you know, like there's people on this call I'll stay in touch with now. You're always meeting new people and looking for ways to help each other. And, you know, I need this, you need that, and which is great. But also, you know, the obvious stuff like travel. I, I've been to places that I would never have gone to on holiday and wouldn't choose to go to. Some good, some bad, but I've seen them. And, and you know, for me, just uh, 20 years ago, I was just a kid in Liverpool who liked going to raves. And somehow here I am going, you know, I'm in some mad country doing some mad thing and it's great. It's just, I think for me, I, I the freedom thing, like I feel like I haven't had a job, I've had a life and I've just been lucky that I've kind of got paid to have that life. So yeah, it's, you know, lucky is the main thing I feel. But you also really work hard and are massively respected. So they go hand in hand. We all work, I think we all work hard, don't we? That's, that's the main thing, <laughs> that it's going to just be a, a breeze. No, two hours sleep in airports, that's all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Rounding up artists to get on flights. Um, Roberto, what about you? Um, I mean, definitely the people, 100%. I, definitely what Rachel said, that speaking to people every day who share the same passion as you, and you just get to talk about that passion as your job. But I think as well, um, the creative aspect and kind of making things happen that you would want to go to. So either like making content that you would want to watch or making an event happen that you would want to go to. So you are almost kind of creating and being a facilitator of other people's good times. That's a bit cheesy, but I, do you know what I mean? And you kind of get to work on stuff that you would like be 
that you would love if you were just going to it and kind of be part of creating that. I think that's kind of a really great part of it for me. Awesome. Okay, so we've had one question come in that I'd like to put forward to you. And I don't know if this is relevant, but if it is, whoever wants to take it would be great. Um, somebody's asked, are any of you parents? I'm a single parent and I'm struggling to see how I could start a career within the industry. Um, are any of you parents? Or if not, have you got any advice? I'm not a parent. <laughs> so, so I, but all I, all I could say from my side is that um, I work with people who are parents and who mm -hmm. are single parents as well. And I think that it, I mean, I don't have a kid, so I can't say how hard it would be because I imagine it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that more than ever, certainly after the pandemic, flexibility mm -hmm. is a big word that everybody's talking about so everyone's now kind of going hang on a second the power's sort of in our hands like maybe we can say how we want to work or where we want to work or whatever so I think if anything personally I would say there's no better time because mm. the conversation's open now so so I think more than ever you can say hey I've got a kid so what I do needs to be able to be flexible and I think you have the power to do that. Mm. I think it's a 24 hour industry as well, which allows for flexibility a little bit more because I work with a lot of parents that are might have day jobs in banks and stuff, but used to do used to be ravers or used to go to festivals or wear festivals full time when they were younger. And they might just jump on and off the odd show, you know, a couple of times a year. It's, it's a Saturday. It's London. It's an easy gig for them. And it's, you know, at least a little bit of pocket money. But corporate shows as well, one-off corporate shows, right? It's difficult going on tour when you've got kids, but one-off shows are, you know, easily manageable. Yeah, and Rachel made such a good point that a lot more now you can do it on your terms and there's so much flexibility, even showing how, um, Becky, you've moved out to Liverpool and I think there's a lot more happening in the local areas as opposed to just the big towns and cities yeah. like it used to always Definitely, be. like, actually, it's been mad because I've, like, I've lived in LA, I've lived in London, I've lived in Ivy there and ran like all of these different events and then sometimes when you're forced to be in one place you have to kind of adapt and like it ends up being like probably one of the best things that I've done moving back because it seems like there's so like a whole new career has opened up for me with all these different things but I know like again I've got so many mates who are absolutely like power women in music you've got kids and I think yeah as you say it's a 24 hour industry so if you've got if you can manage your time and if you've got obviously it would help if there's someone else to babysit with yeah uh you know working from home and everything now obviously does open up so much opportunity for people so hopefully that wouldn't mm. put anyone off because there's like it's absolutely a job that you can still do with a kid i would imagine not that i've got a kid i can just well have to myself <laughs> So thank you all so much. We've come to the end of the panel. We've actually overrun a little bit. 